Hello everybody, welcome to the channel, I'm Axel, and today we're going to be responding to, or, and reacting to, a video uh, that's crit uh, critical of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I was having a discussion with somebody uh, elsewhere in the social media sphere about Ocasio-Cortez because a meme was shared that is, you know, derogatory, and uh, I simply said that she's pretty intelligent and knows what she's talking about, and um this person said she doesn't know anything about economics, and I said she literally has a degree in economics, and then this video was sent to me. So, I'm going to respond to it, because I've never seen it before. I would think that it's pretty pointed, given that, I mean, why would you have a video that's, you know, two and a half years old, ready to go, um, if it wasn't prescient to whatever criticism uh, is to be laid toward her? So, you know what, let's give it, uh, let's give it the good suck, and see how well it does, you know what I'm saying? So, uh... Come along with me on this journey. It's going to be Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, economic genius from Don't Walk, Run Productions. So let's check it out. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the Democratic Socialist candidate for New York's 14th district, has been making the rounds speaking about the economy. Keep in mind that she has a bachelor's degree in economics, so she 100% totally knows exactly what she's talking about. One of the big, biggest problems that we have is 200 million Americans make less than $20,000 a year. That's 40% of this country. Okay, so hang on. It sounds to me like this is her misspeaking. So before he comments on that, let's just look up population of the United States. Let's just say 2021. So 332 million. All right, let's go ahead and whip up. The handy dandy calculator here, okay? We're gonna do this together, right? So 332,524,270 times point v point 0.4, because they're trying to get 40% of it. All right, so that's 133 million. Okay, so she said 200 million, so she definitely is misspeaking. If she's trying to say 40%. Let's go ahead and look up the actual number here. Because uh, that's not, I couldn't even say, like, 40%. That, that's not right. How many, I'm going to click on Amazon, what? How many Americans live in poverty? Uh, actually, let's put this. Make less than 20K. Income distribution. So we got, here's 25K. So that would be closer to 10%. 10% of Americans. And that's being generous because this goes up to 25K. So yeah, kind of no matter way, which way you slice it, she's definitely wrong here. Um, that's the Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Let's see. Daily Show, here, let's go to YouTube. Let's go ahead and pull up The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Daily Show. So, yeah, it's got to be this one, right? My guest tonight is the 28-year-old... Wow. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. Congratulations Thank you. on being the nominee, and more importantly, congratulations on being both the dream of half the... You have been taking it. Um, the term democratic socialist mm -hmm. today, when you stand, is that we live in a society that is capable. We are capable of ensuring that we have basic frameworks where people can be covered by health insurance, can send their kids to college, where we can pursue a, a very bold action on climate change and save our future. And that is part of a. All right, so I think a context that's important here is that she's. Right, not as so. This is before she's gotten a little bit more media training, right? Because she was a grassroots candidate at this time, she had not been elected yet, right? So she was a grassroots candidate, and so she was still making her case to New York, uh, specifically to her district within New York to be elected. So I think that context is kind of important here, um, within the context of someone literally today in the year of our Lord. 2021 sharing this video.
moral and ethical economy and that we can legislate from that value and where it is possible I believe we are morally ob obliged to pursue it right now when you when you speak about that it seems like a logical idea for a politician mm -hmm. to have in America mm -hmm. the way Which you are lacking. framed <laughs> The way you are framed Pandering, is yeah. oftentimes the crazy socialist who yeah. wants to turn America into Venezuela yeah, and into right. Cuba. Right. Now, what I find interesting is, uh, you know, when I think of ideas of socialism, I, I go, okay, there's maybe Venezuela mm -hmm. and there's Cuba, and then I go, but then there's also Norway and Denmark. Right. So, of course, this is like the American understanding of socialism, which is if the government does stuff, it's socialism, which isn't necessarily socialism, like, right, that's just the state. Right, like those fascist governments could do this too, you know, like liberal governments can do this. And there is a distinction between liberalism and socialism, but that's at this point, you know, with the majority of Americans, that's mostly a semantic argument. Do you think there's a, there's a branding disconnect uh, connected in America between some of these policy ideas between generations maybe? Well, between generations, I absolutely think so. I think 9-11 happened in really known or age in a time of, um, in, in our peer up with peers worth of debt. When, 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 when you get spoken about, and this has been interesting, it's been a conversation that I haven't just heard from Republicans, which you would expect, yeah. but I've noticed some uh, establishment Democrats who have come out and said, oh, I've, I've seen the young lady Ocasio-Cortez uh, uh, say the things she says, but it's a little unrealistic. Mm -hmm. You know, she has to be a bit more realistic to move things forward. Mm -hmm. Do you think that when you move into Congress, if you were to win that seat, would you be in a position where you would have to augment your views? Or do you think that you would come to an impasse with other mm -hmm. Democrats? Well, I think, I often say in terms of my style, I'm very idealistic and optimistic about my values and my goals and where I think we should head. But I'm very pragmatic in how we head there. Right. Um, and so I think that I'm willing to, to work with... Which, by the way, um, now that she's been re-elected, has proven to be very true. She's definitely picked her battles right um she's not gone against like uh the party leadership apparatus on every issue even to the ire of uh, many leftists that are a part of the of the like party grassroots structure um so i mean she's lived up to her word on this i mean okay with I'm trying to get to that quote though i think we need to head uh -huh. and so i'm not a take no prisoners kind of person as right. much right. as fox news and all these folks want me to want to portray me as um but i think it's it's about getting to where we need to be you know and uh and that may mean some spirited conversation within the party but that doesn't mean we can't i, I really do believe that we have a much longer path to travel together than one that than before we travel apart when, when you look at ideas you have like uh, supporting a min minimum wage mm -hmm. you are very pro the idea of okay, people earning go. enough to make a living yeah, right shocking I, crazy ideas <laughs> But, but then there are those who say, look, I, I agree with you, but mm -hmm. how do you pay for this? How do you make it mm -hmm. economically feasible? There, there are some who argue and say, I hear what you're saying, Ms. Cortez, and I'm with you, but a $15 minimum wage may stifle economic mm -hmm. growth. Well, first <laughs> we see, for example, studies in the city of Seattle that have implemented $15 minimum wage uh, show that that is not the case. Uh, secondly, one of the big, biggest problems that we have is 200 million Americans make less than $20,000 a year. That's 40% of this country. And how can we have an economy that... I wonder if she meant... Hang on, hang on, hang on make less than twenty thousand dollars a year i wonder if she meant forty thousand or like fifty thousand i wonder if that's what she meant you know what i mean because if it's less than forty thousand you're getting closer to that number right because 8.3 plus 8 is 16.3 plus 9.1 is uh 25.4 right so that oh wait did i fuck up the math right there hang on i'm terrible at math Terrible at math. Let's just find out. Let's just find out. Eight plus nine point <laughs> one. Yeah, it's twenty five. Okay. I'm good. I did it right. But yeah, so that would make sense. If she's talking about forty thousand. So maybe she just misspoke on that. Let's keep going. Let's let's see what this guy's getting at, cause like, yeah. Not even close, baby. The estimated population of the United States is three hundred and twenty five point seven million. But somehow, Ocasio-Cortez, a woman running for United States Congress, thinks that there are 500 million people living in the United States. Maybe she's counting Mexico and Canada, I don't know. Two <laughs> Get it? It's funny. 200 million Americans make less than $20,000 a year. So to reiterate, she's wrong. Okay, so yeah. I mean, she, that is wrong. Um, but I mean, obviously she misspoke, you know, as someone that doesn't have a lot of media training, that's pretty understandable. I mean, you have to, you have to keep in mind that while she was running for this congressional seat, 
I think it was like literally six months prior to this, she was just a bartender. <laughs> so it's a little bit different uh, than like someone who makes YouTube videos for a living, for example. According to 2016 wage statistics, nearly 59 million people in the United States make less than $20,000. Earners, is this, is this the not point? the entirety of the country. Now, 59 million people making less than $20,000 a year sounds like a lot, but let's take a close look because that number is from 2016 and is likely much lower because a lot has happened since 2016. Sorry to keep you waiting, complicated business. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. He's not going to make the argument that Trump has increased that demographic or like that that specific like earning status right he's not gonna make that argument is he because it's true that wealthy people people in this range up 75k up have definitely done a lot better you know obviously ignoring covid because you know covid would have hurt hillary clinton just as much as it would have hurt trump you know um and uh what i mean by hurt is uh like the economy i shouldn't say them because if trump would have responded to covid better he would be the president still i firmly believe that um so ignoring covid these earners made more money like uh so let's look up income gap under trump oh it shrinks oh maybe i'm wrong hey let's learn something Data from U.S. Federal Reserve shows may have found an unlikely ally of the election to lower income earners. The survey of consumer finances revealed in the three years to 2019, the wealth gap between America's richest and poorest got smaller. Families near the bottom of the income and wealth distributions generally continues to experience substantial gains. Okay. The survey also revealed black and Hispanic families experienced faster wealth growth over the last six years compared to... Mm, this is not enough information. Let's keep digging. Let's keep digging. But no, if that's true, then that's actually really good. Okay, so wait, what's this? It's saying income gap grows. Okay, this is from 2020, so let's go with this one, because this one's more recent. Workers' rate, uh, wages are growing faster than their bosses, narrowing the income gap as a result of President Trump's policies, according to Labor Secretary Scalia. At the end of the Obama administration, what we saw is wage growth for the high-wage earners and slow-wage growth for the low-wage earners, which is true, by the way. This is just a fact. Scalia told Fox Business, blah, blah, blah. We flipped that in this economy. Decreasing unemployment and Trump's reduction factors are contributing to low income wage growth. Hmm. Wait, is that just because of the unemployment going down? That doesn't necessarily mean. It's like if someone's going from $0 to $10,000 a year, you know, or $20,000 a year, yeah, that is growth. But that's not the same thing as. That's not necessarily the same thing as, like, it's not how they're conveying it, basically. And how they're conveying it is that, like, low-wage earners, someone who is making 20K by definition is making 30 or 40K now. Or even 25K. You know? And um, oftentimes, this is what liberals like to do. Um, yeah, and I'm using that against Trump specifically on purpose here. Um, libs like to say, oh, hey, you know, this $20,000 person now is making $21,000. That's $1,000 more than they had last year. And while this is true, and I definitely don't want them to have $1,000 less, like it's not actually addressing the root criticism, right? Which is that this income gap is huge in America specifically. Um, but yeah, it looks like they're citing the unemployment rate. Which the unemployment rate was really low. It was actually below like what you would want unemployment to be at because when unemployment is too low, um, that means that like there's going to be jobs that come up that frankly aren't getting filled because people are working. You know they're not looking for a job, and that does create some tension. Um, but that does make wages go up in those areas. So I mean, you know. Wages are going to go up too. Yeah, see, he even acknowledges it here. As unemployment gets better all the time, wages are going to go up. That's really been the goal. Okay, so I mean, and I mean, okay, fine. Like, you're getting people employed, but again, like, if everyone that doesn't have a job right now that is able to have a job, right? Like, let's say they're looking for a job, they can't find their job. Okay, they get that job. They're not making zero dollars anymore, but if they're still making a poverty wage or a wage where they can't support themselves still, right? Like, they, they, they can't pay for rent and utilities and everything like that. They have to have, like, fucking five roommates in order to be, to be able to do this. I mean, 
yeah, they're not as worse off as they were before, but like the problem hasn't really been fixed, right? You've just kind of pushed the problem off to be dealt with later because eventually cost of living is going to factor in uh, as they increase and like their job pay rate doesn't increase with that cost of living increase. You know, obviously inflation is going to be a factor as well as the dollar loses purchasing power over time. You know, someone that was making $7.25 per hour 10 years ago or whenever it was implemented, they had more spending power than someone making that today. You know, and that 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 is a concern just on pure inflation rate. And, you know, that's, of course, ignoring like the cost of goods increasing just because of, you know, profit uh, or, or the need for profit from a lot of these companies. And um, like, the, you know, the four or five agribusiness companies that control food production uh, to, you know, the these multinational conglomerate like real estate agencies and investment firms, um, you know, spiking up the cost of apartments uh, all over the country, um, and especially in urban areas. But, you know, and the reason why I bring this up about urban areas, urban environments like densely populated areas, um, is because, I mean, like, let's be real here, you go to those areas because that's where the work is, you know? So that's why you're, you're, cre- you're creating a tension that has to be dealt with eventually. And the longer you ignore it, the more explosive that tension will become. All boats are being lifted now. This is the same kind of rising tide lifts all boats kind of logic of Reaganism. That's, you know, neoliberal economics 101. The labor force petition race raised measures all people who are working age and either currently employed or actively seeking a job. The people not included in the statistic are on the sidelines, of course, um, but they're increasingly joining the workforce, especially people in prime working age of 25 to 50. Scalia was optimistic about the future. He noted that the U.S. is enjoying an extraordinary economy and the lowest rate of unemployment in 50 years, adding that Trump admin is targeting a job growth rate of 180,000 per month in 2020. That didn't turn out. (laughs) Thanks, COVID. Uh, but again, these would have all been low wage jobs. Okay, so it's definitely true then that um, so my my initial point wasn't exactly correct. So it is definitely true that uh, the income gap has gotten smaller. Um, but I think one thing that even even he is acknowledging, like notice how they're not focusing on the real benefit of of these policies, Trump policies. <laughs> the rich just not, just type this motherfucker in you know so these policies are no joke um uh, let's see here yeah they're they're making this about the campaign cuz this is a campaign article here we go Oh, no, these are about donations. God, fucking New York Times. Get the fuck about this. Okay, never mind. Hang on. Fuck you, NY Times. Here, there we go. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, god damn it. Letters to the editor. Come on. I, I don't like the argument that, oh, well, they paid 70% of income tax, so obviously the tax cut is okay. Um, oh, well, I can't even read the article. So this is an opinion article, but... I was trying to get to the facts. Okay, well, the fact is, though, is that these tax cuts were a huge boon to the wealth of uh, super wealthy earners. And people like in that um, in that letter to the editor were defending it because, you know, they think that because they pay the majority of income tax that it's essentially acceptable. But obviously, that wealth, it doesn't just come out of thin air. Like, you don't, when you're, when you're a wealthy person, you don't all of a sudden just become rich because you have a good idea. It requires workers to help you d- not only develop the product, but develop the ability to produce the product. And of course, the actual production requires a lot of labor as well. And then distribution requires a lot of labor. And then, of course, there's the frontline aspect of any business uh, that deals with selling any kind of product that is also labor too. And so, you know, you taking a piece off of the top to put in your own pocket off of every aspect of that business or every aspect of the supply chain or uh, uh, getting your product to the supply chain, 
Um, sure, I mean, I guess if you want to make some kind of moral argument that because they came up with, like, the light bulb of the initial idea that they deserve more, okay, but at the end of the day, like, I don't agree with the idea that because you came up with an idea that you deserve to, you know, retain, like, 50% of all the wealth from that idea, let's just say, as a number, uh, or at least the, the point is, like, a significant portion of that wealth over the people that actually have to help you implement that idea, you know, like, if I have an idea of cleaning up my backyard uh, I still got to be able to you know pay all my buddies and beer uh, to help me do it and then I can't claim credit for cleaning up the yard all by myself even if I did come up with the idea or you know what I'm saying so um, this logic applies when we're trying to you know work within an economy that's about productive capacity you know like you, you don't ideas in and of themselves don't create productive capacity the, the actual production matters um, but you know, I'm just a, just someone that cares about the well-being of working people, but let's continue this. So why does it seem so high? Well, there are at least three factors to consider. 27.3 million Americans in the workforce only work part-time. Okay. Part-time. Seasonal workers, like people who only work during the Christmas holiday for extra money. I doubt that any of them are making more than 20 grand during the entirety of November and December. And there are more than 19 million workers between the age of 16 and 24. A large percentage of those workers are high school and college students who might work full-time during the summer months, but work part-time or don't work at all when school is in session. And if you factor in their age and work experience, they are only qualified for jobs that pay minimum wage, which puts them near the bottom of most wage earners. But Okay, this is true, but I mean, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be paid uh, a wage that matters, right? So, like, if we were to go with the $15 minimum wage, let's say, and you're working 20 hours a week, and then you work, you know, four weeks. Oh, wow, wow, I fucked that up. 25, wow, what am I doing? 15 times 20, okay? So, that is 20 hours per check. Let's just do that. So, 20 hours per check. So, we'll just do this times two, okay? So, $600. All right. Yeah, you're going to be making less than 10K, but let's just compare that to what the current minimum wage is in a lot of cities, which in a lot of cities is around 850. Let's just be real here. Okay. Well, even let's be generous, say $9, right? Like, and then they're making uh, times 20, which is the check, uh, 20 hours uh, per check for the same comparison, right? Two checks in a month times 12. Right? It's a huge difference. Okay. You know, like if you have a car insurance that is, you know, let's just say $150 per month, which is not uncommon when you're young to have a liability only insurance that is this amount, but let's just even say $100 a month, okay? Um, times 12, you know what I'm saying? Like, see how much of your money is just going to car insurance? And let's say you spend $60 a month on gas, okay? Are you seeing this? $1,920, half of your money, if you're a, a minimum wage income earner, let's just say making $9 per hour, half of your money is going to just getting to work. And, you know, in uh, densely populated areas, maybe you can rely on public transportation. Maybe you do live uh, within walking or bicycle distance. This is all, these are all factors for sure. But let's just be real here. Majority of Americans don't have that luxury. Like, if you live in any of these, like, suburban cities or um, e even, like, just the outlier urban areas, like the uh, densely populated suburban areas that will be outside of a lot of, like, city centers and stuff like that, oftentimes you don't have great access to public, uh, public transportation. And a lot of these part-time jobs that he's referencing will have you, you know, like, when I worked for Walmart, you know, my schedule would be like working from, you know, let's say seven in the morning to 11 in the morning. You know, I, I would never be able to catch a bus where I lived to, to make it not because not only was the bus stop quite literally like four or five miles away from the fucking store I worked at. But even if I was able to make it there on time, the line that ran there ran at uh, hours that were incongruent to my constantly, f you know, fluctuating schedule, schedule times, you know, wasn't worth the hassle. It's just, 
it was, you know, it was too far away to ride a bicycle, and so I had to use a vehicle. And, you know, most of my income went to went to that. And my income at the time was seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. <laughs> so a little bit different. <laughs> so, um. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, th- th- this is a fair point though that like people have different working habits, um, but that doesn't necessarily discount the fact that they should earn a wage that at least makes it to where they're not spending fifty percent of their earned income. This is not even including taxes, by the way, right? Because you're gonna have that tax too. Fifty um, percent of your uh, income going to just getting to work. Right. And this is, of course, not including the cost of food. This is, of course, not including the fact that, like, the average minimum wage earner, average minimum wage earner age is 35 or 36. Okay. So it's not some 19 to 24 year old. Hey, hey, I'm not the expert here. I don't have an economics degree like Alexandria. The economy is going pretty strong, right? There's roughly 4% unemployment, 3.9% unemployment. Well, unemployment is low because everyone has two jobs. Uh, That's not true either. Does she think that unemployment stats have to do with the percentage of unfilled jobs? Because that's what it sounds like. Well, Well, no, that's not what, no. I think she was making a joke that was kind of unrelated i don't think she's outright saying that but uh, let's let's see what the comment says unemployment is low because everyone has two jobs oh they just repeated the same thing all right hang on firing line let's look at this video again because the other video again was kind of like yeah a little little misrepresented right because yeah but let's keep going firing line alexandria ocasio-cortez A few weeks ago, almost no one knew her name. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the <laughs> rising again, star of the program. It's important to note that this is in the middle of her initial campaign. Let's keep that context here, okay? The left is here to discuss her ideas this week on Firing Line. Firing Line with Margaret Hoover is made possible by the Robertson Foundation. David Gave two weeks ago for unseating a ten her opponent, forcing him to join her there. It was a political... According to Lipstick, she has become Alexandria. You worked on that young that to me democratic socialism really means is establish this level that all and to make sure that makes it the best vehicle for a democratic social or perhaps even you know, I think that so many people tap into those values, aspects of human dignity increased its participation significantly in the last few years. In twenty sixteen there were only six thousand five hundred members mm-hmm. of the Democratic Socialists of America. Mm-hmm. In twenty seventeen there were twenty three mm-hmm. and particularly buoyed by young people. Yes. I view the world through a very different lens. Uh, in my life, for example. I was born in 1989, and uh, so at that point, I was growing up during the, the Clinton era, um, and then basically when I was in middle school, 9-11 happened. So when, we, when you think about young people, it's important to think about the general timeline, the world that we grew up in. I was in the true economic process, tippy top of the 1%. So I think when, I think rally and cry mm-hmm. in your campaign, basically 4% unemployment, 3.9% unemployment, the left versus the, okay, right, the, left versus the right. right. Now, the economy is going pretty strong, right? There's roughly 4% unemployment, 3.9% unemployment. Um, do you think that capitalism has failed to deliver for working class Americans, or is no longer the best vehicle for working class Americans? Well, I, I think the numbers that you just talked about is part of the problem, right? Because we look at these figures and we say, oh, unemployment is low, everything is fine, right? Well, unemployment is low because everyone has two jobs. Unemployment is low because people are working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and can barely feed their kids. And so I do think that right now when we have this no holds barred Wild West hypercapitalism, what that means is profit at any cost. Capitalism has not always existed in the world and it will not always exist in the world. When this country started, we were not a capitalist. We did not operate on a capitalist economy. You know, the, the benefit of capital. Okay, so... All right, so maybe the that initial point isn't necessarily correct, but like she's not making a a policy position here, right? Like she's not saying that unemployment is low uh, because of uh, people having two jobs. The point that she was making is that when we focus on low unemployment numbers, we're focusing on the wrong set of data, right? It's not about low unemployment; it's about gainful employment it's about valuable employment it's about when you when you working a job not expending the majority of the money you earn at that job on you know necessities it's about having some dignity associated with your employment so that's clearly what the point is here it's not a policy position it's an ideal it's an it's it's like an it's an ideal you're reaching for an ideal that's what the ideal is Unemployment is low because people are working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and can barely feed their kids. Her claim that everyone has two jobs is incorrect. 
According to the Bureau... Okay, so she obviously didn't mean literally... Come on. ...of labor... This video is so pedantic. How the fuck does it have 3 million views? Are conservatives really this low IQ? ...statistics. The percentage of the American workforce with two or more jobs is only 4.9%, and in the past 25 years, hasn't been higher than 6.5%. Even PolitiFact called her out on these claims by giving her the infamous pants on fire rating. But she's learning. She's meeting with the best people. I sat down um, with a Nobel Prize economist last week. I can't believe I can say that. It's really weird. But, um, <laughs> she's not good with words. If people... <laughs> <laughs> She's not good with words. <laughs> okay. Pay their fair share. If corporations and the ultra wealthy, for example. Dude, she was a bartender like six months before this, and now she's talking to millions of people on a nationally syndicated talk show. I mean, that'd make me nervous too. So. And like, I, I'm not a fucking dictionary. You know, you see in this video here how often I'm just looking shit up to make sure that I'm understanding stuff correctly. I don't remember things just like that. It's really easy to act as if you do know what you're talking about when you have, like, a prepared video with a script and you've done research for, like, this video. I don't know. How do people fall for this shit? Honestly, this is so stupid. As Warren Buffett likes to say, if he paid as much as his secretary paid, 15%, if he paid a 15% tax rate... <laughs> so her plan is to make multi-billionaire Warren Buffett pay a 15% tax rate. Got it. Which is stupid because Warren Buffett pays a 20% capital gains tax. I should also note that Warren Buffett's secretary pays a 35% income tax rate. But do go on, Alex. This is fascinating. If Look, okay, her name is not Alex. It's Alexandria, first of all. But... Let's go ahead and see what the fuck she was talking about. Because I, I don't know. Maybe she's referring to like a 15% wealth tax. 15% tax Buffett. Oh, whoops. So this kind of looks like it's relevant because it's from December 2018. So last year, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the youngest woman ever elected to Congress, was working as a waitress at a restaurant near Union Square in NYC. Warren Buffett is the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, and according to Forbes, he's worth $87 billions. It may seem like the two would have little in common, blah, 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 blah. Taxes should respect a person's station in life, including working people plus parents. It's ludicrous that we tax Buffett's secretary more than we tax him, which is true if we're talking about actual rate. So I think that was the real point she was making. And he's deliberately missing it to nitpick about numbers. Uh, let's see here. The 29-year-old included a link to a CNN article from 2013 that quotes the interview Buffett did with C CNNBC, uh, in which he says that he is probably the lowest-paying taxpayer in the office at Berkshire Hathaway. Buffett, who's long been vocal on the subject, explained that even if the marginal tax rate rose for wealthy wage earners, because much of his wealth comes from investment gains, he would still pay a lower percentage in taxes than his secretary. Taxes should respect person's station in life, including working people. Now, what I don't want is for our public funds to be funding freebie helipads for Amazon. Oh, yeah, this is for that Amazon thing. Uh, I don't think I need a tax cut. Yep, and he did say that. Yep, I don't think we should have our Olympic team 20 years from now be the eldest sons of the Olympic team currently. Oh, interesting visualization, I guess. 53% of adults strongly agree that the wealthiest Americans should pay higher tax rates. Okay. So I think this is the actual point. So maybe in this interview she didn't word it well because she was a congressional rep like candidate with n like virtually zero media training, right? Having been a bartender just before becoming a congressional candidate. So yeah. Uh, corporations paid. Uh, if we. If we reverse the, the tax bill, but when 
raised our, our corporate tax rate to 28%, which is not even as high as it was before. Right. The federal corporate tax rate in the US before Trump's tax cut was 35%, the highest in the entire world. But thanks to the tax cuts, it's now at 21%. Yeah, and even like citing the 35% thing always frustrates me because oftentimes you can just not claim certain income that would be taxed by this rate so that either it becomes untaxed or you would qualify for certain tax subsidies uh, so that um, effectively you either don't pay taxes or even, you know, having made billions of dollars, get a return on paying no taxes, which uh, companies like Amazon and Netflix do uh, on the reg uh, every single year. So this is also deliberately missing the point. Like if you're looking at 35% tax rate, cool, but how much of that rate is actually like enforced, the actual enforceable tax rate? Uh, I don't know if that's the actual term, but like how much of that tax rate is actually collected? Like what percentage of that percentage uh, is, is shockingly low. It's shockingly low for a lot of these huge corporations and these wealthy people, might I add. And since companies can afford to invest in new workers, U.S. unemployment is at the lowest in history. Why would you want to? Re companies don't. Companies don't invest in workers like this. That's not how unemployment works. Whenever you have an economy, and consumers within that economy can spend money, then the workers have to be hired by the business to meet the demand that consumers create. It's not that businesses just have money, and then they, out of the graciousness of their heart hire more workers that's not what the actual model is the model is holy shit we don't have enough workers to meet demand and we're losing out on potential revenue we need to hire more people to capture that revenue convert the tax cut and jeopardize thousands and thousands of job opportunities um if we if we do those two things and also close some of those loopholes that's two trillion dollars right there that's two trillion dollars in 10 years two trillion dollars what loopholes? She's just saying a bunch of words. Let's just, I don't know, because like, I'm thinking in his head, all right, what am I doing to prepare for this video, right? So like, theoretically, I mean, he pulled up data sheets and shit about like average wage, uh, wage earners and stuff like this. So how would I look this up, right? So let's just look up the words she used. Let's just say tax loopholes, two trillion dollars. Rich could get nearly $2 trillion tax cut under Trump's tax loophole. President Donald Trump's tax treatment of pass-through income could cost as much as $1.95 trillion over 10 years, according to a new analysis, and more than three-quarters of the cut would go to the wealthy. The Tax Policy Center said that if Trump's plan to tax pass-through income at 15% takes effect, federal tax revenue could drop by $1.36 trillion over a decade. Adding in the amount of income that would shift, quote-unquote, to take advantage of the pass-through rate would raise the total to $1.95 trillion. Trump's tax proposal calls for cutting the rate for income that passes through limited liability companies, sole proprietorships, and S-corps to 15% to match the reduction in the corporate tax rate. Yet critics say the reduction will cause people to turn their ordinary income into pass-through income and get the lower rate uh, rather than the 35% top tax rate proposed by Trump. Pass-through income mainly benefits the wealthy. The Tax Policy Center said that three-quarters of the benefit from the tax cut will go to the top 1% of earners. They would see an average increase in their after-tax income of 4.8% or $76,000. The very wealthy would see the biggest gains. Those in the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of the income distribution, those with incomes exceeding $3.4 million, would receive an average tax cut of almost $638,000. By contrast, fewer than 5% of households in the middle quintile of the income distribution would see a reduction, averaging about $370. Lowering the tax rate, sorry, quote, lowering the tax rate on pass-through income would affect a few taxpayers or would affect few taxpayers in the middle or bottom of the income distribution, but provide large tax reductions to a relatively small number of households at the top of the income distribution, end quote, from the Tax Policy Center. So clearly, with literally 30 seconds of searching, I think not even true, 10 seconds of searching, we figured, we solved the dilemma of what this man is questioning.
it. And Trevor Noah isn't even questioning the validity of her claims. Oh, yeah, because he's probably familiar with the article. But honestly, when he's saying, right, he's probably like, you know how when you're listening to someone talking and you're showing that you're actively listening, you say like, uh-huh, sure, right. Like if I'm listening to someone go on ranting on and on and on about a topic I know nothing about, I'll be saying stuff like sure to understand or to relay to them that like I'm, I'm listening to them. So that's more than likely what he did, so. Wait, he gave her a big hug when she came in, so he's not questioning anything. Now okay. Now, if we implement a carbon tax, on top of that, so that we can transition and, and financially incentivize people away from fossil fuels. If we implement a carbon tax, that's an additional amount of, um, of, of a large amount of revenue that we can have. So a barely coherent Ocasio-Cortez wants to charge consumers an additional tax for electricity, natural gas, oil heating, and gasoline. And carbon tax won't change consumer behavior in the slightest. It's just a cash grab. And let's, Fact check that. I'm actually, I actually don't believe that. Do carbon taxes lower demand? I don't know. Okay, so hang on, hang on, hang on. So his argument, let's re let's revisit it. Carbon tax won't change consumer behavior in the slightest. It's just a cash grab. That's his argument. Um, the Institute for Energy Research, which I bet is not unbiased, is worried about the reduction of economic growth. And uh, I have curiosity. Who the fuck funds these guys? About. <laughs> Free markets. Objective science. Efficient outcomes. <laughs> we are unbiased. <laughs> oh no, government should be unbiased. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Meet our team. I'm curious about who these people are. Let's go ahead and just Google one of them. Let's, let's look up. Let's look up Stephen Hayward. Who's Stephen Hayward? Conservative author and political commentator. Policy scholar. Ooh, fascinating. Let's look up Preston Marshall. That's a cool. It's a very dignified name. Preston Marshall. Uh, didn't pull anything up. Let's look up Trent. Who the fuck is this? Why are, who are these people? Why are we getting some known names? Partner at Capital. I don't know, man. Well, point the point that I was trying to get at here is that these people are clearly like they're conservatives, you know. So the and they say that it's going to cause economic slowdown. And like to be real with you. I don't agree with punishing the poor, so if we're going to have some kind of a carbon tax, I would want to couch that in a benefit to poor people, you know, um, either through some kind of like n negative, uh, negative tax rate UBI style program for people who make under like $70,000 a year um, or, you know, something like this. You would have to like root it in something to offset the cost to the poor. I mean, that just makes sense to me investments in like battery tech and electronic tech to give you like subsidies for example so that it's affordable for you to buy an electric vehicle um but the, the the reason why i say this is because when you do increase the cost of something less people buy it <laughs> you know unless it's an inflexible good now energy is pretty inflexible in a lot of respects but you know people wanting to drive around less you know, not heat up their homes using oil and gas as much because of the cost of a carbon tax. That's some real shit. And I, I don't, I don't see any one of any kind of uh, political persuasion that would argue against this. 
because the people that are arguing in favor of a carbon tax say that is the point. And the people arguing against a carbon tax say that that's why it's bad. <laughs> so, yeah. And then the last key, which is extremely, extremely important, is reprioritization. Just last year, we gave the military a $700 billion uh, tax, uh, budget increase, which they didn't even ask for. So that is, mm, that's not right. We gave them a $700 billion budget, not a budget increase. Um, it is true that the DOD often does not ask for budget increases and, in, like, certain stimulus packages that go with, like, manufacturing tanks and stuff like this. So her point is correct, but she misspoke. The entire military... And again, I want to see him make this kind of a video against her today. You know what I mean? Like, this is someone who doesn't have a lot of, me you know, media training and stuff, so, like... This is a guy fucking writing out a script and doing a YouTube video, so it's easy to appear pithy and, you know, authoritative when you can fucking delete any fucked up delivering of your script. Like, even now, I'm just recording this in one take. Any fuck up that I have here, I just own it and just move on, you know? The budget for 2018 is $700 billion. So saying that they got a $700 billion increase is incorrect, if not impossible. Secretary of Defense James Mattis has literally requested higher budgets to make the military more lethal. In fact, the military is always asking for more money. So for Ocasio-Cortez to- Well, that's not necessarily true, because, like, there have been cases- I mean, don't go wrong, the DOD definitely does request budget increases year over year. I think what she's specifically referring to is that there have been numbers, a number of cases where Congress will pass a law requiring, like, um, we, like, set up a contract with um, a defense contractor to manufacture, like, a bunch of tanks that the DOD doesn't want, for example. Like, uh, let me see if I can find the story. It's uh, tanks the DOD doesn't want. I don't know. Congress again buys Abrams tank the army doesn't want. So it's from a military.com. The new defense, but, uh, what the fuck? You want to talk about institutional racism? Mm -hmm. Uh, the new defense uh, spending bill includes $120 million for tanks that the Army has repeatedly said it doesn't want. For three years, the Army, in numerous congressional hearings, has pushed a plan that essentially would have suspended tank building and upgrades in the U.S. for the first time since World War II. The Army suggested that production lines could be kept open through foreign sales. Each time, Congress has pushed back. Last week, Congress won again in the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2015. So, and, like, this is... It's, and, Again, like, and that's the thing, like, this is, this is pretty common knowledge if you're familiar with these issues, like, if you read up on this stuff, um, I don't expect every single person to know this, and the fact that she kind of misspoke a little bit, um, conflating the two things, like, first of all, getting the budget number wrong for pithy assholes like this that's gonna make you appear like you don't know what you're talking about, um, and then, of course, conflating that with a project like this, right, like, we're, we wasted $120 million, and more because we have to we still have to maintain these tanks that we don't use so say that they didn't ask for an increase is just bizarre they're like we don't want another fighter jet like <laughs> they're like don't give us another nuclear bomb you know? right. they they didn't even ask for it in summary ocasio cortez seems so again she's she's being personable Right, she's just talking about the issue, um, and she's not being very specific. Because uh, if she would have, in her example right there, said we don't want any more Abrams tanks, she would have gotten the same kind of personability across as someone who's you know running for office and trying to you know relate to people that are potentially voting for her. Uh, but she would have also been correct, and this entire segment of this stupid fucking video wouldn't be here. Incapable of math and basic research. She just says a bunch of things and hopes that interviewers, like Trevor Noah, are not well-versed on the subject and will take her words at face value. I mean, why? I mean, that's what he's... That's what you're doing right now, dude. Like... <laughs> okay. So I think in conclusion, um, people like to be mad at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because... Honestly, like... It's because she is intelligent. And she does know what she's talking about. And it's very easy to quote mine somebody, video mine somebody, and make them appear ridiculous. 
than it is to actually engage with the meat of their arguments. Notice how here this is all about semantic posturing and critique of rhetoric. Not once here has there been any kind of policy prescription uh, analyzed uh, or an ideal criticized. So I think uh, I think we'll wrap it up there because uh, that was a huge waste of time. So if you're still here, thank you for sticking around. Um, I don't know why you did because, frankly, I don't know why I did. But if you liked it, please subscribe. Uh, if you disliked it, please leave an angry comment in the video below. Um, and, yeah, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs>